The Measure of a Man The Story of a Father, a Son, and a Suit My father lived with his grandparents in Sherbrooke, a small town serving the farms tucked among the rolling hills of Quebec's eastern townships. They ran a laundry. My father attended a school run by Jesuits, who used to beat him. It may have been the beatings, or it may have been the urge to escape poverty that forced my father to head out on his own at the age of thirteen. He found work as a waiter at a Chinese restaurant called The Dragon Room in Chamedy, a rural suburb north of Montreal. He lived in a room above the restaurant, and that's where he met my mother, when they were both fifteen years old. The Dragon Room was owned by Montgomery Chang, the man who would become my maternal grandfather, and his uncle, Stanley. Montgomery had immigrated to Canada in 1956 to establish a foothold in Quebec before sending for his family. When the permits came through, my grandmother and her four children, including my mother, flew in from Hong Kong to reunite with Montgomery and start a new life in Canada. One of the first things the family did when they arrived in Canada was visit the Dragon Room. The day my father met my mother is a day he never forgot. It was December 7th, 1964. Snow was blowing outside. He saw her walk into the restaurant, cold and shivering. My mother didn't even own a coat. He noticed her tweed skirt suit with the hem above the knee and her high heels. He also noticed her legs. I am told he stared which is forgivable. My father was the youngest person working at the dragon room and possessed little guile. All the other waiters teased him. That's the girl for you. It wasn't a joke for my father, though. He told them all, I'm going to marry her. From then on, whenever my mom came by the restaurant, it was always my father who volunteered to take her home. Their conversations were limited. My father spoke English, French, and the Chinese dialect of Toisanese. But my mother spoke Cantonese. As a result, they mostly walked in silence. It didn't matter. My father was already in love. In the summer of 1965, during one of their strolls, they were caught in a thunderstorm and ran back to the house. It was empty. The rest of the family was still at the restaurant. My father and mother stripped off their clothes and made love for the first time. According to my mother, he had claimed me from the start. There was no one else. I have a picture of my father from a few years later, during what I call his rebel without a cause period. His hair is swept up in a pompadour, just like James Dean's. He wears a red windbreaker with the embroidered provincial emblems of British Columbia and Alberta sewn onto his sleeve. Proof of a cross-country trip. What always catches my eye about this picture is how the sleeves of his jacket drape and fall exactly to the crook of his wrists. The perfect length. I also see he is a work in progress. Even then, he liked clothes, but he's still searching for how clothes can make the man. I see in this picture ambition. He believed he had to make money to be my mother's one true love. And at the age of 16, she had long black hair, dark smooth skin, and strong high cheekbones. She was impetuous and socially unguarded. She didn't drink. She didn't smoke. But she was the wild one. She was beautiful. So when my mother entered grade 10 in the fall of 1966, my father made sure she was the only girl at school wearing a diamond engagement ring. A year later, my mother was pregnant with my older sister, Tammy. Exactly a month after Tammy's birth, my father married my mother, and ten months after their wedding, 
I was born. By the time my father was 19, he was married with two kids, and his family was living above a diner on Sherbrooke Street in Montreal. He had no education, no real skills. He now worked as a busboy at Ruby Foo's, a Chinese restaurant frequented by the wealthy and the famous. And my father was a keen observer. He took note of the style and the manners of the customers and began to emulate them. He was handsome, he dressed exceedingly well, and he learned to move with athletic grace. Then a job opened up at the illustrious Contiki Polynesian Restaurant, housed in the elegant Sheraton Mount Royal Hotel. He worked as a busboy for one week before he was promoted to host. In my father's mind, big love and big ambition went hand in hand and he wanted it all. If you walk by the shop, it always looks closed. From the outside, it seems to be in a deep hibernation. I mean, there's no way anyone conducts any sort of business inside. I mean, not to say it looks abandoned, just fallow, somehow lost in the time stream. The shop resides on the ground floor of a narrow brick building no wider than 25 feet across. The bricks have started to flake, and they might crumble entirely if you poke them hard with a stick. Even with the lights on, the cluttered storefront windows, the water-stained ceiling tiles, the flaking gold leaf letters on the glass announcing modernized tailors, all of it suggests that if you try the door, you will find it locked. But it won't be. Along the walls inside are hundreds of bolts of fabric that belong in a museum. In the center of the shop is the cutting table, and most of the work here is made to measure. Existing pattern blocks are laid out and traced with tailor soap, a white waxy bar, onto four yards of wool. The lines are then adapted to fit the specific customer, and then the cutter, either Bill or Jack Wong, will cut out the pieces that will make up the suit. At the back of the shop is the workbench. This is where the sewing, steaming, pounding, and muttered Cantonese swearing take place. Bill, Jack, Park, and Laddie each have their own spot on the bench, but I don't. I'm allowed in the back only when one of the tailors is away. If I use a spot at the workbench, I have to pick up all the threads and scraps. I am to leave nothing behind. In fact, if you were to come into the store when I'm there, you would likely trip over me. When I sew, I use the machine right by the front door, a black 1904 Singer foot-powered treadle machine converted to work with an electric motor. Not the best machine for a beginner, but that's my fault. You see, I lied when I told Bill Wong I could sew. During my first official week as an apprentice, Bill sat me down in front of the old singer and gave me a scrap of wool to test my skills. Sew me a set of parallel lines, then turn it around 90 degrees and show me you can stop the machine when you reach a line. I don't want to see one stitch go over. I lifted the foot, placed the scrap underneath, rolled the hand wheel to set the needle in the ready position, and then I put my weight on the control pedal, and I tried to apply only the slightest pressure. The motor began to turn over. Slowly, the needle marched down a line, but my hands were in the wrong position, and the stitches started to veer to the right. Oh, oh, good. Uh, you shouldn't pull at it. Let the machine do the work. Just guide it. I made the machine advance a few more stitches. I thought you could sew. I just need to get used to the machine. It's very sensitive, I said. Bill said, it's just like driving a car, working the motor with the pedal. I don't know how to drive. Okay, you just push on the pedal gently and then let it speed up. Everything will be okay. 
even though the motor on the Singer was nearly 100 years old, it is capable of reaching 1,500 RPMs when it's well serviced. And this one was. The needle flashed up and down, and the feed dog turned out to be a pit bull. The machine grabbed the scrap out of my hands and flung it off the table. Golly, said Bill, you better practice. He shooed me out of the seat and slipped in. See, you have to control. You should be able to make the machine do anything. Watch my knee. I control the foot pressure. That way I can go backwards or sideways. He moved his hands in small circles, the needle flashing and dancing at his whim. When he was done, he handed the scrap back to me. In perfect cursive overstitches, he had written, J.J., learn to sew.